Hello, we're back for a new episode of the AJ Bruno Show. My guest today is Rupert Bonham, one of the most popular and prolific players in the history of Survivor, and also the former 2012 Libertarian nominee for Governor of Indiana. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Great. Well, well glad hey, to. You guys got me. Yes, fantastic to have you on the show. Oh, Great. I'm so sorry. I've been trying to charge my phone. And I'm I'm having a little trouble with my darn phone, and I was trying to get it charged. And, uh, so how are you guys? No worries. All right. How are you? Very good. Very, very good. Very good. Just ending my day working with my mentoring program and, and uh, well, we're def- starting to relax. Great. Well, we're definitely going to talk about that. Um, can we... Let's start off with, uh, can you tell us about your background, more about that, and how you ultimately came to apply to be on Survivor? Um, Well, you know, for years in my mentoring program, I've always shown my young men and women in our program to have those lifetime goals. You know, everybody should have the daily goals of being able to make it to work and the weekly goals of trying to save a few bucks every week and monthly goals and yearly goals, but that life goal of, you know, I used to tell my kids, someday this world is going to know who I am, know what's going on in our world, know how, you know, I am the best, but I'm not sure exactly what I would show them I'm the best at, but, you know, show them that. And uh, then one day we saw the, the show Survivor on TV, and I told my kids, did you see that show? That's that's how I'm going to do it. I'm the best camper I know. I'm going to get out on the show, and so I can I can survive, win a million bucks, and go on with my life. Oh, wow, that's great. So uh, what was the process like of being cast on the show for you personally? And all these years later, do you think it's any harder or easier than when the show was still fairly young at the time? Well, you know, years ago, it was a little harder having to make that – three-minute video before the days of everybody carrying around a video cam in their pocket, you know, on your cell phone. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, I I would bet they still have probably 100,000 people a season trying to get on that darn show. I know in the heyday, they probably were getting close to a quarter or a half a million people trying to get on Survivor. So, you know, the competition maybe has gone down a little bit, but it's still, uh, you know, it's pretty tough to get on the show. But it's well worth it. You know, there's a lot of people that have been trying for years that finally get on. No, I can imagine. So um, one of the most memorable scenes in Survivor history was, of course, uh, the infamous shoe-stealing incident in your first season (laughs) of Pearl Islands. Uh, was there anything we didn't see on camera about that in terms of how everyone reacted to this innovative act of piracy? You know, when I did steal everybody's stuff out of their canoe, I didn't let anyone know that I had it. The only other person out there that even knew I had stolen anything was little Johnny Fairplay, who I had in my haste been trading shoes and trading stuff, and I mismatched some of the lady's shoes. I gave him all my mismatches and all my stuff and told him, go down that alley and trade for whatever you can. He was the only one that even knew I stole everything until they saw it on TV. Wow. Yeah. You you came back uh, the very next season for All-Stars. Uh, how taxing was right. it to have such a quick turnover coming back and then fighting to make it so deep into the game the second time? You know, I love being able to show that I made it further the second time around with harder players, and I was that first one to do back-to-back Survivor. You know, in Pearl Islands, I dropped over 50 pounds in 27 days, and then All-Stars, I dropped almost 65 pounds in 37 days. Uh, But also, all the gray in my beard and the gray in my hair, my body all was cleansed. The gray was all gone. I had never been so clean, you know, going through so much <laughs> hard times, living, you know, on bugs and snails and worms and slugs and the fish we could catch. And um, it was tough. It was tough. But I like showing that, 
you know, you got to be tough, but your body is made to live outside. We've just forgotten the the hardship of it sometimes. Yeah, we did it for a long time. So oh, yeah. what was it like? Yeah, sorry. Sure. Uh, so what was it like when you learned that you had won the America's Favorite Survivor Prize and by such a huge majority? Uh, you know, uh, at to be when I came back from All Stars after doing back to back survivors, we finaled Pearl Islands. You know, I mean, I had been out of the game of All Stars for just a few days, and then went to the live show and the reunion show of Pearl Islands. Um, it's to be able to know in my head just that I had made it so far to the final four in the, in the very next game. I had so much, I, I didn't care. It was so fun sitting in that finale. But then when I finally got to all stars finale and they announced that they were going to award a second million dollars, Oh my gosh! Uh, it was being—I mean, I have been living for the last six months with everybody just in the world sending us mail and calling us up and showing up at our house and catching me on the street and catching me and hiring me to go out to appearances and it was crazy how big of a celebrity I turned into. And then when they said, okay, now we're going to open the phone lines up for 72 hours, oh, my gosh. I didn't want to believe that I was going to win. I was happy with where I was. But, you know, it. it uh, I kind of felt pretty confident. And when it finally happened and Jeff was writing that check, signing that check for a million dollars on my back and handing that over, oh, my gosh, the best survivor moment for me and my family ever. I don't <laughs> think we'll ever be able to top that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it was amazing. Fantastic. So in, uh, in Heroes versus Villains, uh, you made the, the fatal error of trusting Russell. Uh, what made you think he would possibly keep his word, and how tough was it coming so close two games in a row and not getting to the end? You know, uh, you didn't see trying to get Sandra on my side to vote against Russell. Um, I, I kind of had an idea. That's when I had the rock in my pocket. And I knew if somebody out there had it, they would have exposed me for having a rock in my pocket. Unless it was Sandra. You know, yeah. and she's pretty quick and she's pretty sneaky. And. You know, I could never get her, even though she hated Russell, too. Uh, so all I had was trying to play, you know, the game with evil Russell. Um, <laughs> it, uh, if in Heroes and Villains, you know, if maybe I hadn't broken three bones in my foot on the first day, you didn't see the, me setting my own broken toes and asking them for tape so I could tape them all up when they were telling me I had to walk out of the game. Oh, my gosh. And I made wow. 36 days on broken bones that I set myself. Um, I, I was happy how far I got anyway. You know, I was happy that I started getting the villains out before they got all the heroes. Uh, right. There again. <laughs> If JT wouldn't have given the darn immunity idol to a villain, maybe he wouldn't have been voted out with his own darn idol, and uh, maybe the the villains wouldn't have been so powerful. No, that was really foolish, and um, and I remember oh, when yes. you, yeah, <laughs> when you injured yourself, and I can't imagine how you make it through that long with with broken bones in your foot like that, especially given all the physical competitions. I mean, that was just crazy. Well, and if you look back, there were no swimming challenges. It was all stand to be strong or running challenges or climbing challenges or, you know, hanging by your fingernails and your toes. Well, you know, I I, I had three broken toes. <laughs> it was a little <laughs> tough in that one. It was a little tough. Wow. So so the, the last time you played was in Blood versus Water, and 
nothing went right in that season. Uh, why do you think you were targeted so aggressively so early like you had never been in the past? Uh, you know, honestly, I have never taken anything to Survivor that I cared more about than Survivor. When I took my wife, and everybody knew how I felt about my wife, um, you know, of course, my own tribe was begging me to stay when I traded places with my wife. But the other side, the the loved ones knew it was a good strike against me to vote out my wife. Um, um, but like I told Jeff, uh, you know, when you make me decide between <laughs> the game and my wife, oh, my gosh, especially the first time I ever brought her out with me. Of course, I'm choosing my wife. I mean, we've been married coming up on 21 years. Um, I've always said I don't want Survivor to ever break my family up. I want it to make it stronger. Um, But I also told Jeff and Mark Burnett and all the people, all the powers that be, you vote, you bring my wife and I back to Survivor and try and vote my wife out again. I will look at her. I'm sure I'll be crying. I'll say I'm sorry. I'll hug her and kiss her, and I'll walk back into the game. I'm never walking out of the game again. <laughs> but, yes, in Heroes in, or in Blood versus Water, oh, my gosh. I, I, I never went to my own camp. I never got to my own you know, got my own torch. I never went to tribal council. I never got a vote. Um, I went to Little Redemption Island in a teeny little arena that is set up for balance and, you know, hand-eye coordination where uh, swimming and being strong and, and last and doing the endurance challenges, those are my strengths, not some silly little stand on one foot and balance a peg or stack some blocks or something, you know. Uh, yeah, no, so, which are just yeah, um, yeah. a waste. I don't know why they do those. Um, <clears throat> but was there one, I guess it's hard to pick, maybe it's hard to pick one, but is there one moment from the game you wish you could take back and that you didn't do a particular thing in any of your seasons? You know, in the, in the very first game I was in, when I was a Drake and uh, – the Drakes threw their challenge, and I got pirated over to the Morgan tribe. I I went through my little same thing I do in my mentoring program, you know, in Rupert's Kids. I went and did the empowerment thing and built everybody up, and we played games, and we went out fishing together, and we started winning, and I got them to be a winning tribe. I should have stayed on the Morgans instead of going back to the darn Drakes. Yeah, that's a good point. That's you know, in the very first one, I should have stayed there. I could have, I could have turned the whole game around, got a few of those villains out, brought a couple of the drapes with me over, and uh, it would have been a totally different game. Oh, you would have been set. So, yep. a few miscellaneous survivor questions before we move on to some other areas. Um, <laughs> yeah, what's, okay. what's your fondest memory of your time in, on Survivor, and what's the the one moment you just you would like to forget? You know, when I was that first person that went back to back, after I got to a point where I knew in in All Stars, I had made it far enough and won enough prize money to pay all my bills off and get myself back to zero. And I still had a good week, 10 days in the game. I would wake up in the morning feeling great. You know, I was still playing the game with Rob and Amber and Jenna and I. We were that first four people strong alliance. I had wholehearted faith in them. I watched Rob and Amber stand up against their friends protecting Jenna and I. I mean, I woke up. If I, I still remember the feelings that I had when I woke up out on the island thinking, you know, if I had my wife and daughter with me, I would disappear into the jungle and never be seen again. Man, I found freedom. I'd wake up in the morning and think, am I going to finally get that shark? Am I going to finally get that jungle chicken I hear clucking all the time? And I, you know, and you start thinking about what you're going to catch. And stop <laughs> worrying about the, the, the rat race. And you start thinking about, you know, just kind of, Living in the living in the now and living off Mother Nature. It was cool those last few days until I got voted out. It was wonderful. 
And if I would have been just a little step quicker, I would have beat Amber and made it to the final three and maybe won that darn game. But yeah, you know. that would have been. <laughs> You know, that's, that, uh, those memories are wonderful. And, you know, setting my own broken bones in the first day of Heroes versus Villains, where it, it had been six years I waited to get back on the show, and I finally got there, and I, I maimed myself. When you see a toe upside down and pointed at you, laying on top of your foot instead of, you know, sticking out straight like it's supposed to. Um, it's a bad feeling. When you see one pointing off, you know, underneath everything else, pointing under your foot, it's a bad day. Uh, um, that's pretty I would, uh, that, that I could do without. That, I, that, that really, you know, even my daughter watching Survivor uh, Heroes versus Villains, my daughter after the end of the show would say, man, Daddy, you, you were a little angry, you were a little mean. And I'm telling her, I'm, I'm in pain, you know. I, every once in a while, I would hit something uneven on the ground. I would put my foot down. It would re-break, literally re-break my toes. I would hit the ground and be expected to get back up and keep going and not really complain about it too much because I didn't want to bring too much attention to it. It was bad. Wow. That does sound bad. Yeah. Um, so building on that a little bit, uh, for those who have never experienced it, what does being on Survivor feel like for everything we don't see on the limited footage we're shown, whether it's roughing it in these exotic environments or being surrounded by camera crews all the time? You know, you it's amazing what you can get used to. And you get to a point where you could even go to the bathroom in front of the darn camera people. You don't, you don't <laughs> care anymore. But it's the pain and the cold of night. Night times can be miserable. It's cold and you're hungry and, you know, it's just, it's rough. And sometimes the bugs just eat you alive. And, um, it's hard to show the pain, you know. I know that, that it used to be a lot harder when they gave you no food. And we would watch people become emaciated on the Dawn Show. Now they, you know, and they realize how hard it used to be. They're giving them a bag of beans and a bag of rice at the start of the show now. But yeah, it's hard yeah. to show the pain and, you know, the coldness and the 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 meanness of the night. You know, <laughs> a cold breeze off the ocean when you're already freezing cold and you've got no blanket and you've got no bed and you're laying on bamboo. That's just hard. Um, it's rough getting through the night sometimes. Yeah, it sounds intense. So, for for me, uh, Rudy Bosch just seems like an extraordinary man. Is there a contestant that you most admire? You know, I really liked Rudy Bosch. He was a good guy. He is a good guy. Um, big Grave Digger James. I mean, I love Grave Digger James. He and I were uh, buddies through Heroes and Villains. Um, Big John the Goat Man, you know, he was, he's been a buddy since back in the day when I played All-Stars with him. I really liked him. Uh, I like a lot of the new ones, too, but I have not met them. I haven't got to, you know, I, it's not the same as what it used to be where there was just a few survivors and people would uh, would invite us out and we'd go play celebrity. And I've kind of had to go back to my job, <laughs> so I don't know a lot of the new ones. <laughs> yeah. For me with Survivor, there's been times where I don't watch it for a few years, and you come back, and that draws me back to the show. So, you know, that's a good incentive for them. There you go. Let people know <laughs> that uh, they can get a hold of CBS.com, click on the little Survivor logo, get to the chat room, and say, we want Rupert back. <laughs> so um, if you, there's something I've been curious about. If you had to speculate – uh, what portion of the contestants do you think are recruited, and what do you think about that? Uh, to me, there, was, there has to be more real fans out there who they would add something positive to the game. Um, you know, I, I know at least one potentially great contestant they've never given a call to. So, You know, I tell people all the time, I hear those same rumors of people getting recruited off of Facebook or off different places. I always, you know, I was that guy that applied. I never got recruited um, until, you know, I turned into Rupert from Survivor. And 
Yeah, and then now I have to wait. They already know I will play every game. Uh, <laughs> but I tell people, get on Facebook, get on this, any of the social medias, start talking about how good a contestant you would be. Start showing some different adventures. In my video, I didn't just stand up and say who I was. I showed me out in the Everglades with my family out paddling around and my daughter saying, oh, look, Daddy, there's an alligator. Go get him. And you see me get in the water, sneak up on him, jump out of the water, grab the alligator, bring it back to the boat, um, dance it around with my daughter and her rubber alligator, uh, let it go, you know, give it kisses, let it go. Show who you are on Facebook. If there are recruiters out there, they'll find you if you make yourself known enough. Yeah, good advice. So before yeah. we, we dive into politics, uh, some people might not know you also appeared on the Israeli version of Survivor. What was the story? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, like, it used to be a couple of survivors, uh, a couple of countries were doing, well, there still are a bunch of countries that do their own version of Survivor, you know, Survivor Israel, Survivor uh, Australia, Survivor uh, Germany, I think. I don't know. Um, but, uh, and I'm trying to plug my phone in and make sure it doesn't die. Um, but the uh, Survivor Israel got a hold of us and hired me as a prize. Uh, it was wonderful. And if you can find them out there, the subtitled ones, Survivor Israel, uh, the subtitled ones where you can understand, or unless you can understand Hebrew, um, some of the things that they're talking about with me just sitting right there, it's hilarious. But, you know, the two tribes would battle and win fishing gear and me for three or four days. And I stay with you. I teach you how to go catch fish. I catch fish for you. I teach you how to use all your stuff. I show you what you can eat in the jungle. I sit up at night and tell different people what they're thinking about you and how you can maybe turn it around and get dug in a little better. And Yeah, I, it, it's kind of fun being Rupert from Survivor. Wow, that, that's pretty awesome. Was this like a scale yeah. down, noticeably scaled down from the American version, like you, you could tell or, or not so much? Um, it's it, Well, you know, their Survivor comes from – uh, Castaway Productions out in England, in London, that took the game, uh, used to play the game as, uh, I think it was called Robinson Crusoe, and they would put people out on an island for months, months. <laughs> um, Mark Burnett was the genius that made it, that Americanized it, made it into a really cool game. Um, and then I think... Castaway Productions has probably just copywritten that in other countries. Yeah. You know, and so they, they make their own little versions of it. Makes sense. So yeah. you've been a longtime member of the Libertarian Party. Uh, what core beliefs right. do you have that led you to joining them, and what do you think the problem has been with being able to break through as a viable third party? You know, I tell a lot of people that you put 10 Republicans in a room together, you're going to get 10 different views on what a Republican is. 10 Democrats in a room together, you're going to get 10 different views on it. 10 Libertarians. I was that moderate Libertarian that would show how we need to, and this was 15, 10, 15 years ago, create those public-private partnerships that are transparent but that we're encouraging private industry and not making, not choosing one over another, but creating open bids, getting the lowest but best, you know, bid out there, um, you, spending limited government dollars to create services and fulfill needs for our people that are struggling. If we bring people out of poverty, it empowers Everyone, if we take those entitlement programs and turn them into empowerment programs like I have been running for 25 years, not spending any government dollars, but saving tens of thousands of government dollars per person in my program by teaching them how to make a legal living, getting them that sense of self-worth and teaching work ethic, creating a community-minded adult 
that is not an angel, but is also not one that goes out and takes advantage of others and uses and abuses, but actually gives back, pays their taxes, pays their way, and gives back to society, passing that forward, helping others along. Um, I am that libertarian that wants to show, yes, we need limited government, not expanding our government, but creating a government that is transparent. When we spend $16 billion in Indiana and a billion of that is going to locking our people up, I want to see why it costs so much money to put people in an overcrowded jail that's half privatized and feeding only one hot meal a day and cold sandwiches the other two meals. And I, I joined the Libertarian Party years ago to help try and create a little more sensibility in our government. You know, mm-hmm. not trying to eliminate our government, trying to bring some respect back to our government. <laughs> uh, well, we could use a lot of that. So. Oh, my gosh, yes. You know, accountability. We all need a little accountability and someone looking over our shoulder. You know, in my Rupert's Kids, in my mentoring program, my taxes have been published in the Indie Business Journal year after year after year for years. You know, it's uh, they, some of us are looked at outrageously hard, and the ones that set the rules sometimes pull an iron curtain in front of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's you know, ridiculous. we've got we've got rulers that don't like to even share what they spend, what they pay on their taxes. We've got rulers that don't like to admit to doing, you know, or being or whatever. But we, if, if private citizens try to do that, I'm sorry, uh, it's illegal. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> oh, there's definitely anyway. Anyway. So, oh yes, um, oh, yes. what? Uh, what motivated you to, to run for governor of Indiana, and what was uh, that experience like? You know, after we had a governor that was termed out, and it was pretty much an open seat between the Democrats and the Republicans, and it, I knew in the 2012 election it was time. Indiana was starting to try and write into our Constitution the denial of same-sex marriage, the denial of transgender rights. That's when most of the country was still in that battle of that civil rights battle of giving all of us a base level of rights, not only the ones that, that kiss on the opposite sex, only the ones that look like we do, only the ones. No, um, it was so much time. Um, unfortunately, just like showing in our detention center that is uh, filled with 50% of the population just hurting themselves, 40% of the population in that 50, 40, over 40% in jail just on pot offenses, which is insane because the people making the laws were smoking pot back in the 60s and 70s. Now they're putting people in jail for it, but that's another whole story. Um, why I ran to try and show we do not need to incarcerate 20% of our population. We do not need to make the detention centers and the court system the fifth largest generator of our gross domestic product, generating trillions of dollars a year of our tax dollars, putting our families, our children, ourselves, our neighbors in jail over petty crimes and then privatizing that so we can make even more money off of it. At the same time, we're, like I say, it was time to stand up for the last, and there's still a civil rights battle, civil rights battles out there, but the last major civil rights battles to bring the LGBTQ community into mainstream America, like all of us, um, and shine a light on the insane money spent on the detention center and try and bring some accountability and some credibility back to our government. Those, those three things, just like I show my kids in my mentoring program, when you've got something to say, you should stand up and say it. Hmm. And I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on some of the social issues, though, you have someone like, Ron Paul, who's maybe not a member of the party, but more of a libertarian, who's more conservative on those. Right. And I'm sure 
there is libertarians who tend to have those sorts of views. Um, so how do you reconcile those those differences? Um, you know, it's uh, in any party, you're going to have extremes on both ends. Uh, there were a lot of libertarians that would shudder when I would talk about helping to create more mass transit instead of eliminating you know, public funded mass transit, which like, you know, a lot of the hardline libertarians would say, but Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. There are a giant sector of our population that would depend even more on a public transit. And that could actually become profitable if we ran it like a business instead of running it like a government agency. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, So, so you know, you got to drag people along sometimes kicking and screaming. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so in terms of some of the past political figures who you think are great examples of, of what leaders um, or statesmen should be, who are some of the individuals that you look to? Hmm. Uh, hmm. I guess that's a tough one. Uh, that's that's uh, I, you know, honestly, you look on the Democrats and the Republican side, both. Um, there, are, there are a lot of them. When I stood up and said, uh, when I was debating against uh, uh, Mike Pence and John Gregg in our governor gubernatorial camp, uh, uh, debates, mm-hmm. um, I'm not running to be one of those politicians that is that normal guy and goes out to a job that pays 80000 or $90,000 a year and comes back after the first term with millions of dollars in the bank more the people on each side of me have done. I'm that one that's going out to actually do the job, come back and go to work like we are supposed to. Very, I couldn't name one person, one elected politician that doesn't worry about becoming elected again. What I would want to see out of our politicians is be willing to go out for one term to actually bring some credibility back. Maybe they would be elected a second term, and maybe we would see um, a little honor in our elected officials. But I couldn't tell you one that I really find that I would want to act like. Um, a lot of them do good things, uh, but unfortunately I am that guy that has dug a little deeper and looked a little harder. And um, You know, that's, that's just the way it is. Sometimes our politicians go out with all the best intentions in the world, and, you know, it's hard to stand up. Yeah, that's, that's pretty common. So could uh, could you tell us more about your charity work and how that has developed since you originally founded Rupert's Kids? You know, Rupert's Kids, I started back in the 80s. I was working in a, uh, a giant mentally, mentally challenge, you know, our terms back in the day, the MHMR units, uh, big 2,000 client facilities that I really, I found where I fit. They worried about client care, quality of life. It was back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed working in the institutions that, you know, didn't worry so much about the documentation, but about the quality of life. Then I watched our feds and our state officials come in and start really, uh, as they said, teaching us how to cover our own tails and show it the pretty much taught the documentation and started really pushing the documentation. And it got to the point where, um, you know, I... Uh, Sometimes people will believe that anything written down is what happens. And, you know, just like in our government, it's it's sometimes the perception instead of what's really happening. I ended up leaving the institutions and creating Rupert's, well, first, Kids Hope, Kids Helping Other People Exist, that took only juveniles and taught them how to make that legal living. When they weren't making it in school and we were incorporating the zero tolerance and the three stripes in your out, and throwing children out of school in the late 90s, um, 
we were just destroying lives. But we were also creating major, more major problems that I talked about 20 years ago. Now we've got 15, 20-year-old young men and women shooting us, being raised by children that we threw away 20 years ago. But we started at Kids Hope back in 91 uh, showing if you're going to get rid of the vocational training in our high schools, if you're not going to help people with the secondary education unless they're going to college, if you're going to throw them out on the street, we better do something as a society. Um, we created a vocational mentoring program that partnered up with the Juvenile Detention Center and would even go as young as 12 years old deeming them incorrigible and working them a 40-hour work week and teaching young men how uh, to make a legal living. But the mm-hmm. really, the youngest of them, the 38 young men that we had that were 12 years old, by the time they were 15, every one of them was back in school. Um, I can't say that about every 22-year-old that I've, uh, I've ever had. So, in 91, we created Kids Hope. We ran that for 12 years until Rupert, until Survivor came along. And then I found national attention. Unfortunately, I didn't buy my own name or my own company's names. And by the time I was out of All Stars and trying to buy Kids Hope and Kids Helping Other People Exist and Rupert Bonham, some wonderful person already out there, bought them. So I dissolved Kids Hope and incorporated Rupert's kids. A month later, I won a million dollars. I hired lawyers and accountants, reapplied for my nonprofit status. Um, Instead of taking years, it took three months. Now, the feds did get a hold of me and say there are so many programs for juveniles. If you age, you will program up to those transition years. That 17, emancipated 17-year-older to 21 that's a big program. That's a big uh, group of people that get left behind. You know, you're out of the juvenile system, but you're not ready. Ready. We aged our program up to youth instead of minors and have been running. We never stopped the program. Even when I left for Survivor, there was still mentoring going on. But mm. we've changed our name, and now Rupert's Kids teaches young men and women how to make that legal living, how to have that sense of self-worth. We work on uh, properties that we buy from the city, and we work with senior services, helping the elderly and the disabled, um, you know, build their houses back, fix their bathrooms up, create those handicap showers and handicap ramps, Um, just teaching kids how to go out and make a legal living, how to, you know, how to go to work. It works. It helps us all. Instead of putting them on a path to hitting that revolving door and running back into the detention center because they have no way of making a legal living, get them out there, get them working, get them going, and let them go. Yeah, that's great. So Yeah, check out rupertskids.org. We're getting a new website here real soon in the next week or so. So... Uh, Keep an eye on it. Keep an eye on it. It's, it's the University of Indianapolis here picked this up as a project. I just saw the final version last night. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's coming in about a week. Oh, we'll definitely check out the site. Well, yeah. it was um, it was great talking, and and I hope there might be another season of you um, as a contestant on Survivor. And who knows, maybe I'll join you. Oh my gosh, that would be wonderful. You start telling all the people. You've got thousands of people that are listening to you, maybe millions. If they all got out and said we want to, they they want to see you and I out on Survivor together as a team. Maybe CD has to listen. Yeah, that would that would be great. And um, you can trust me more than well <laughs> for fair play or any of them. So you know. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, um, it was great, and thanks again for coming on. Oh, thank you so much. You guys have a great night. All right, you too. Bye. Bye. That was Rupert Bonham. Um, nice, interesting discussion we had there. Everything from survivor to politics to his charity work. Um, we had a little bit of a technical snafu at the beginning, but we will get that cleaned up. And those of you listening in the archives are not going to hear that. So uh, anyway, um, we'll be back. Uh, This coming week, the guest for that is not yet confirmed, but I can tell you that on May 14th, 
Uh, we'll have former Maryland government and congressman Robert Ehrlich. He'll be with us then, uh, so be sure to tune in for that. And um, until next time, uh, this is A.J. Bruno signing off. Thanks.